my live coffee talk show. I'm Michelle Quay. I'm a confidence mm -hmm. and leadership coach. And I work with negative self-talker. Raise your hand if you're not a, a, a negative self-talker. I think everyone, we all are. So today I am really super excited because every week I bring a special guest to you so that they can inspire you with their real life story. And hopefully through their journey, through their story, you will find some elements that would inspire you to want to take action, whether it's love, courage, or creating more connection through your relationship, this is my purpose. So I have Kyle Dean Houston here today, and he is the author of Patchwork Junkie. Well, <laughs> he's gonna speak more about that. So he's a speaker, author, and coach who is committed to bring hope into the world. After walking out of prison at 35 with no college degree, no network, having never sent an email, he built a highly successful career as a sales executive in San Francisco. In less than a decade, he went from earning $10 an hour to a vice president for a $2 billion publicly trade company. He also put multiple companies onto the list of Inc. Magazine in magazine's fastest 500 list, Kyle's life story is shocking, reviving, and insp inspiring. He currently lives in Tampa, Florida with his wife and two daughters. And you can find Kyle at kyledeanhouston.com. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please give us a warm welcome to Kyle Houston. Hi, Kyle. Hey, how are you? I, I um. I, I don't know how to handle that that intro. That's uh, it made me sound really important. I love that. <laughs> you are important. I mean, come on, you just published a book. <laughs> so, when, I did. When you, yeah, when you first um, put out that post, because I follow you on Facebook. And so when you first announced that you published the book, I was like, yes, he's going to be on my show. <laughs> so I was super excited. I am. I, I feel the excitement and I, I love this energy. It's exactly what I needed this morning. So, um, so thank you for being excited for my book. I can't wait to tell you about it. Yeah. Tell us about it. Don't, don't, don't keep me. Don't hold back. Okay. Uh, uh, so there's so much to tell, right. But mm -hmm. um, the, the very, the very short piece to all of this, and then we can dive into the details. Um, it, it's a story about how I was a young entrepreneur uh, in my mid twenties, and I got addicted to methamphetamine. Um, ended up in prison. Uh, did seven years of my life. Uh, you talked about some of the things that I did after that, but um, I gained all of this insight. Uh, I went through multiple tragedies, multiple situations that I think most people would have stopped at if just one of them happened in their lives. And I learned a lot of things about myself, about purpose, about my place in the universe. Um, and the result of that is Patchwork Junkie. So um, there's so many ups and downs to it. But uh, I think that you and I made a commitment to one another that we would make this an organic conversation. So if you'd love to fire away some questions, I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer them. I, I can't wait to ask you a lot of questions because <laughs> <laughs> it's all like, you know, my mind is always racing. It's always uh, very spontaneous and creative. So like, as you're mentioning, you know, what I, what I hear is because a lot of people um, in their twenties and thirties, they're going into that place where they want to tap out of what's going on and going, going on around us, whether it's in the family or whatever that's that they're experiencing. So they're tapping out of it. And by tapping out of it, sometimes it means, you know, hanging out with friends and doing drugs. So what was it like? Cause you know, in my life, I, I was, I was like, like you said in the post, you know, I'm very, uh, what do you, well, how did you describe me? Like highly conscious or something about the right minded and, and you on the other hand is a hot mess. And I think a lot of people who are going through that stages of life, they would describe themselves as a hot mess. I met guys who describe themselves as a hot mess. So what was it like? Uh, so let me let me be very clear. Um, I think I'm a hot mess for life. And so <laughs> that, that was kind of my point in the post. You're so enlightened and you've got your, your act together. Um, but what I am is a, a constant improving entity. Uh, and that's what I've committed my life to. And I've also committed my life to helping people become that, 
a constant improving entity as well. But what it was like, uh, if we're specifically talking about the drugs, um, because there's so many episodes to this story. Uh, so I think, I think it's good to set a foundation for my, my childhood really quickly. I come from a, a very small town, uh, 5,000 people, 4,600 to be exact. Uh, shout out to Higginsville, Missouri, if anybody knows that, that place. Uh, but very uh, small town values, had a, a decent family. Um, they had a, a town business. And I seemingly had a lot of things going for me. Things came easy to me. I was the high school athletes. I was popular. I was all of those things. And drugs, although I really enjoyed them recreationally, um, did not seem like the path that my life was going to take. When I got to be 25, 24, I had a carpet store. I had eight employees. And I had no understanding of weakness. But again, things came easy to me. So I didn't understand. I didn't have empathy. I, I didn't have humility, uh, which incidentally I've found out is a, uh, a, a common theme, a recurring theme in my life. But getting, finding myself in the throes of drug addiction as quickly as I did and just going head over heels into meth addiction um, was the most debilitating experience of my life because I'm still introverted. I still pay attention to what's going on at this point, but I'm seeing weakness. I'm seeing that I'm never gonna pull myself up. And I decide at one point that the only way I'm ever gonna get out is to die. The only, it's either gonna be an overdose or it's gonna be suicide. And that's the only way I'm gonna get out of the game. And I started using needles. And so my addiction spiraled as low as you can ever imagine. Uh, and then I started to manufacture methamphetamine. And in a two-year period of time, I became one of the biggest meth cooks in Kansas City in 95, 96, got arrested and was facing 30 years with no parole. Mm -hmm. So I cannot begin to tell you how, um, how dizzying and how debilitating and how scary a situation like that is. But when I ended up in... The, the prison cell. I ended up in a cell by myself for 23 hours out of every day. And this went on for a year. Mm -hmm. I made a decision that I was going to figure out truth. I was going to figure out what I believed, truly believed about life after death and God and spirituality. And, you know, whether I was going to buy into my childhood religion anymore, or whether I was going to uh, expand upon that. So it was an amazing experience at a certain point coming off the heels of the scariest, most debilitating, lowest, most lonely time of my entire life. What was that certain point like? What, because, because I think, you know, for a lot of people, as they're hearing the story, as we hear these amazing journey that people have gone through, Oftentimes, we're curious about what was that pinpoint? Where, where, can, where can we find that point where suddenly you woke up and, and you said, you know, I, I want to do something different. I want to try something different. Sure. Well, I, this is the first thing I would say for everybody. It's different. And that, that point can happen for anybody, but for everybody, it's different right? Just like we have different thumbprints, just like our path to salvation is always going to be different. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I, think, I think it's really important to kind of put this in context. Um, I had just burned every bridge that it ever existed in my life, even with my own mother, right? I uh, was alone in every way you can imagine. I was suicidal up until this point, And I was trying to wrap my mind around the idea that I was never going to get out of prison. To me, 30 years was a life sentence. And this was no parole, so I would do the entire 30 years. So I was scared, um, had insecurity, shame, guilt, uh, times the nth degree. And the point for me was when I started to get some clarity, because clarity doesn't happen overnight. When you use drugs at the level that I was using them, and it's methamphetamine, um, it takes months before you start to recognize your father's son or the person inside your head. And once all that started to happen, I, I just, I got to the point to where I can't control anything anymore. I can't lie my way out of this. I can't manipulate this situation. I'm in a, 
an eight by six box with myself. Okay, God, why? And that, that's what was the, the seed to all of this was why, how, and then I started to figure it out. So it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah. I never felt so connected to so many things than I did when I was removed from everything. And I liken it. Look, I'm not some Buddhist monk by any means, but I liken it to going to the Himalayas and sitting by yourself and taking a vow of, um, you know, not speaking and all those other things and fasting. I, I liken it to that. Only I was forced to do it. Yeah. Wow. Nobody, I never talked this way. So sorry about all that. <laughs> No, no, I love it. And I love the I love the fact that you brought up the question why. And you know, honestly, why is my favorite question. And a lot yeah. of times, you know, we're so afraid to ask why. And you know, why really tap into the the bottom of it? You know, it's really the core reason. Like, why are we not doing certain things? You know, why are we hiding? So I love the question why. Um, I kind of want to, and, and thank you so much for, I really appreciate that whole, you know, vulnerability and that you're completely honest about the, the story that, the, the journey that you have gone through. I kind of wanted to um, pull the timeline further a little bit, because by the time you got out, what was that like? Were you, were you experiencing a lot of judgment? Cause, cause then, you know, I can imagine that you would be starting looking for a job. You'd be looking for a way to keep up um, in your own living. So what was that experience like and how was the world treating you and how were you treating yourself? So you talked earlier in the very beginning of this, um, you wanted people to raise their hands if they're negative self talkers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, 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 all the what ifs I had built for seven years. Incidentally, I'll, I'll, you know, spoiler alert, it's in the book, but I, I didn't get the life sentence. I didn't get the 30 years, um, although I faced the life sentence and 30 years twice. Um, what I did do is I did seven years of my life behind bars. Uh, I lost a stepfather who raised me in the process. Uh, one of my children got put up for adoption at the age of four years old. And I never talked to him again until he was 18. Uh, one of my children went from six years old to 13 during my prison sentence. And I, I lost all sorts of things. But by the time I walked out, I had built new relationships. I had rekindled old ones. Um, I felt strong, but I felt like the entire world was going to judge me if they ever found out. So I walked out institutionalized. I walked out scared to death. I walked out ashamed. Uh, I was hiding from who I really was. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to um, put on a facade and get through this. But the one thing that I did have that I'm very proud of is I had a bulletproof belief that something was going to give and I was going to find my opportunity and I was going to rise above all of this. So I had this crazy, I wouldn't even call it balance. I had this crazy swirling soup of all the negative emotions. And then this unstoppable belief that I was going to work my way through it. And that's what walking out at the age of 35 was like for me. And it was lonely. It was like, I mean, I think a lot of people hear my story and they say, wow, he must've come out with his head screwed on straight, ready to take on everything. No, I came out and I spent months imagining that it would be better to go back. Imagining that where I belonged was now prison because people didn't understand me. My sister, my mother, I had PTSD. I was doing all the crazy stuff in my head that, that people do. And I had to battle all of those things. Um, it it, it's not something I wish on anybody. And I'll, I'll end the, the answer with this. It was, it was more difficult for me to walk out of prison than it was for me to walk in. And that's a fact. And that's where the, it's not where the work started, but that's where the real trials and tribulations started was when I could put all of the stuff that I had, um, that I had, uh, that was conviction. Now I could put it to test. Wow. And, and I would imagine that if 
someone walking out of you know the cells they they would be saying well this is freedom you know i can't i can't wait to get started and and the fact that you have to put on a facade it's almost like you know wearing a mask and completely hiding from everything that you had in the past and it, it's really it sounds really draining and and really debilitating and when you said you know you're not an enlightened enlightened being I completely disagree with that <laughs> because <laughs> you actually just put yourself wrong. <laughs> you are really, really enlightened. And I think you have a great high level of consciousness and that it, it, it took a journey for you to, to get here. And I think that's a tremendous amount of achievement and that anybody can ask for it. And so I, I'm kind of wondering, have you ever wondered, and by the way, everybody, this, just, this is just a disclaimer, this was not prepared. I, we have not talked about like the question that we were gonna ask, so it's completely spontaneous. Uh, some of the question I'm gonna throw out is actually gonna catch Kyle in a, you know. <laughs> in a, oh, I've been warned now, yeah. No, I, and I wanna add this, yeah, I wanna add this. We actually made a commitment to make this as organic and spontaneous as we could because we both love that. So fire away, hit me with your best shot. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> was there any point in your life that you start thinking about why was I the one who's experiencing all this? Yeah, no, of course. Um, I mean, it, it started, it started, it started with the addiction. It started, uh, it, look, it, everybody has that question, right? Things happen in everybody's life. You don't have to go to prison. You don't have to ruin your entire life to have the question why. I, 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 to, I truly believe that's the, the meaning of life is to ask that question. Whether you figure it out or not, you know, good luck. But to ask that question is why we're here. And it had been happening my entire life, but but the real whys, the, the what the hells started happening with addiction, right? It started like, how can I, a, a person that's very proud of himself, um, who's accomplished anything that he wants to and, you know, has all these talents and skills and all this stuff, falling prey to addiction. And it started there. And then the answers didn't come the addiction just poured on. It was like the universe said, okay, we'll answer that, Kyle, but you're going to have to get a little more of this. And through the, uh, the series of spiraling deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, that why got stronger and the answers started to appear. And it really boiled down to, and here's where I'm going to make myself a real liar about you know not being enlightened. But the answers boiled down to None of the stuff that you found important matters. Um, all of the distractions that you had in your life, all of the skills and the talents and whatever you think is smart and sharp and witty about you, Kyle, is not you and doesn't matter. Those are just your ego. Those are just tools that you get to use in this lifetime. What matters is love, oneness and service that was the answer i just got chills excuse me for a second my hair is kind of standing up but that was the answer that came to me in that cell by myself and that's what i found out mattered and that's what i have uh dedicated my life to figuring out because that's not an easy one to unpack those are loaded answers but um but i think i might have answered more than you asked me i'm sorry no, no, no. <laughs> I can, I can imagine, you know, the two of us, you know, may, you know, every, and your family too, we can all go up to uh, Himalaya and, you know, right now we can all practice some uh, Zen and meditation right now. <laughs> it, it's on my bucket list. It sure is. But, yeah. but I can't, I can't, I can't take a vow of silence. It's just not my nature. <laughs> That's the thing that stops me. <laughs> I got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I can see that. I wonder you why that, you were yeah. here, right? <laughs> I wonder why you chose that profession. There's, All right, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, there's way. something about speaker. They just you give them a mic, they won't drop it. You have to uh, yank it out. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm giving it back to you right now. Quickly. Uh, yeah. So so you know, 
so moving forward, you actually created a business. You create a successful enterprise, going from ten dollar per hour to was it two two billion dollars? I was a vice president inside a two billion dollar publicly traded company. Yeah.、Um, yes. Go ahead. What's the question? Like. Okay, this is, so this what? Is the fun you part. Know, that's everyone. <laughs> that's a life everyone ever can ever possibly dream about, right, Kyle? So you are a very successful person. What does it feel like? And that's what I think majority of the viewer would like to know. What does it feel like? And where are you now? And how do I get to that point? Sure,、um, I, I'll, I'm gonna break some hearts.、Uh, none of it mattered. None of it matters. It was it was a part of that facade that I had been building since the day I walked out. It was it was an extension of my fear and my insecurity. Every bit of it.、Um, I'm glad I had it. I'm proud, and I'll tell you,、um, it almost killed me getting to that point in a short amount of time.、Um, I, I had stage four cancer at one time, and I attribute it to all the shame, guilt, and And concern, but for me, that ten-year period, there was lots of great things. I had babies that I I loved dearly.、Uh, met my wife. Oh my God, we've had the best adventures. But living it was just white knuckling every single day of my life, and thinking that my past was going to catch me. So I worked harder than anybody else had to. Or did because if someday somebody would look me up on the internet and find out that I was a five-time convicted felon,、uh, they would come to me and say, "You can't work for us anymore. You can't represent our brand." And the crazy thing about that is, I, I was putting these companies in Inc. Magazine's fastest 500. I was doing amazing things. We we took a company, the the team that I ran took a company from 1.5 million to 14.1 in 12 months. In the softest economy since the Great Depression, that is something that go that not a lot of people have on their resume, and I still felt like it wasn't enough, like I wasn't good enough to stay hired. So, all of that, all of those achievements, really were just a sign of my insecurity. Where、mm-hmm. I took my life back was when I started writing this book. When I took my life back, it was July of 2017, and I recognized that every decision I was making was about insecurity and the guilt and the shame. I recognized that I was diminishing the life of my family and my wife. Like it could be better. There's so much more, and I started to write the book simply to release all of this baggage.、Mm-hmm. So that was the important part of me. I'm sorry. There's probably a sexier answer in that. It was really cool, and there was some money, and we had a great house and beautiful friends. All of that's true. All of that's true. I think you broke a lot of people's heart. They're like, "What? What do you mean? None of these matter." <laughs> of course, it matters. It's money. Of course, it matters. Money no- is everything. <laughs> M- money does. Money does matter. It certainly does. And there's different problems with money. But to me, I'm talking about to me specifically. All of that success was. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do it again, and I'm gonna do it right. And I'm going to do it to where it does matter, and it's not the money; it's the amount of people that I help in the process. That's what the next phase of my life is going to be, and we'll talk about that till the cows come home.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think、uh, when we when we first connected, I had、um, I, I think I shared with you that one of my goal is actually to open a nonprofit to sponsor school. So I had you in mind, like. In in year from today, I'm gonna reach out to Kyle. Kyle, you said that you will contribute. I'm gonna、uh, hold you to it. And now that I have it on the tape, you can't run、oh, away no, with it. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll put you on speed dial. Whatever you need. It it almost sounds like what you were going through with that facade, and and even though you were really successful, you didn't believe or recognize your own success. So it almost sounds like there was a bit of that imposter syndrome where. We keep wanting to look for more, 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 more in order to achieve more, 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 but we never really go back and and recognize our own achievement. So, where are you now, like in your life? 
Sure. Um, can, can I touch on that for just a second? Because this, yes. this, this, this may make some people excited. Um, the imposter syndrome is a sneaky, sneaky little devil. And it, it certainly existed, but not to the extent where I didn't feel like I was a director or I didn't feel like I was a vice president or I didn't feel like I was a sales leader. When it came to sales and growing sales teams, I found my stride. I found this thing that I can do that is powerful and it's me. And I get to, I get to be all me, full frontal Kyle, and I get to do amazing things that people point to and say, way to go, Kyle. And quite honestly, that is what's driven me for most of my life. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an incredible thing for me. And I did it on a scale that was, was a lot to point at which is great. But the imposter part came to came with, I'm still a convict. I'm still a drug addict. If these people only knew, like I'm hanging out with MBAs from Stanford and because I'm, I'm in Silicon Valley, I'm in the Bay Area, I'm in startup and everybody around me had these great educations and I don't even have a college degree. So I'm sitting here thinking, oh, if they only knew, that's where the imposter thing stepped in. So I, again, we're not going to let them know. And even if they do find out, they're going to say, who cares? Look what he's doing. So where am I now? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Had they ever find out? Like, so now you're, you're a different path and never. They, they, well, not never. They know now, oh. but they never, they never found out then. I didn't start telling people, oh, this is so great. Um, that entire 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, well, it went on for 13 or 14 years, but that entire 10 years, before I walked out of my, my corporate job, mm -hmm. I, was, I was hiding it all. M my my in-laws didn't know. My wife knew, of course. My wife knew 40 days after we met. I felt responsible to tell her, but nobody else knew. Our closest friends, um, the people that worked for me, the people I worked for, none of them knew. And I had to leapfrog from position to position. I had to create a world where I didn't have to walk in with the resume. I walked in and all I had to do was say I wanted the job or not. I had to do that um, because I couldn't tell anybody. So I was hiding. I was living this double life that was scary. And that's what I mean by the imposter syndrome and the facade. So now you ask the question where I'm at today. Today, um, the book was written because I wanted to not only get it off my chest, not only relieve myself, but I wanted to create a body of work that would never allow me to turn back again. So this book is so raw and so honest and so scary for me. Patchwork Junkie, even the name Junkie, having the name Junkie associated with Kyle Dean Houston was its own journey, right? But for me, I told myself every time I, I said, oh, should I put this in the book? I told myself every time, put it in the book and it'll never have power over you again. So the guy that sits in front of you today um, is still a hot mess. I promise I wasn't lying. It's still, a, <laughs> it's still a, a, a work in progress, but I don't fear who's going to find out because I, I do a little bit. I still have that, right? It doesn't just go away, but I've told everybody that is of significance in my life and nobody has turned their back on me. Most people protect me. Most people love it. Most people encourage it. So, you know, that's think, the guy that stands before you now. I think there's so much power in our vulnerability. And a lot of us are really afraid of being vulnerable. It re really, you know, it's about us being afraid of how other people is going to find out and what they're going to think of us. And we're actually building a wall and block and barrier to prevent people from coming to us and us coming to them. So I, I applaud you for coming out and being vulnerable with your book. And, you know, I think it's a great value. And just from hearing it, it's already making me really inspired because not many people come to that state where they're, they're, they're enlightened beings. And, and 
I think you would agree that enlightened being just mean that we have a different perspective into life and what matters to us and what are something that's meaningful to us and what do we really need to hold on to it's not the materialistic world it's more of a you know a love compassion our kindness so where where do you see yourself um a year from today oh that's such a good question um covid COVID-19 um, <laughs> got, in the way of, got in the way of a lot of things where I thought I'd see myself today. But where I, I see myself a year from now, um, you know, of course, the book's out and it's doing whatever the book's going to do. I, I, I will tell you, and, and this is part of my awareness, the book by no means was ever written with the, un, the, the idea that it would be a source of income. The book was written for two reasons, to give me the release that I needed and to provide understanding and hope for the people that it's supposed to. The book is supposed to be written. I went through my stuff so that I could get to a point to where I can tell my story. So this book will get into the hands of as many people as it's supposed to. But where I see myself is on the heels of that book, talking more about um, other people becoming vulnerable and other people seeing themselves as a being of worth, not just worth. Worth is such a, a cop-out. But I, I want to be a guy that people can point to and say, hey, I'm not the only one. And if this guy from Higginsville, Missouri, this drug addict from Higginsville, Missouri, can do what he's doing, then so can I. And I want people to see that they have an amazing gift that is being waiting, that is waiting to give to the world and they're the only ones that can give it. And maybe that happens five years from now on a grander scale, but a year from now, that's what I wanna be talking about. That's what I want the narrative to be around me is hope and understanding and belief that people can just, can be more because nobody deserves to live with the shame that I lived with. It's so beautiful, <laughs> so beautiful. I have no doubt. And you know, a year from today, I can see Kyle inspiring all those who need to hear from you. And I truly believe that you're gonna make it happen. I do. Thank you. You're not a hot I, mess. <laughs> I mean, <I'll, laughs> give, it, give it some more time. <laughs> <laughs> because I think a lot of people are going through their journey and they think that they are alone, you know, and, and, and thank you for saying it because that was how I felt when I wrote my book and I don't need like to be a, a you know, like a, um, what do you call that bestseller, I just need one person, one person who can resonate with the story, whether it's patchwork junkie or, you know, any, any book that's out there. Just one person, if they can be inspired and, and wanting, knowing that they are not alone in this world, I think we serve our, we serve our purpose. We've done an amazing thing. And I, I, I got to tell you this, and I know I've said it to you more than once, but um, your authenticity, your, um, it, it just your genuineness is so inspiring. And it's just an amazing thing. I hope people get all of this when they're listening to, to your show, but you make people want to be better. And I just, I love your energy so much. I, I wish I could surround myself with dozens and dozens of Michelle's <laughs> because it's, um, it's I, I already feel like a year from now, I'm going to do exactly what I just said because I said it to you. <laughs> and you have, I have it on tape. So a year from to today, I'm, gonna, I'm committed. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. post it on Kyle's Facebook. Everybody, I'm going to post it on his Facebook if he has not accomplished what he said he was going to do today. All right. I will. So I, I am your accountability partner now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs yes. that, especially me. So. All right, Kyle, is there any um, like takeaway message that you would like the audience to take away with? today um well so we we talked about hope we talked about people believing in themselves um but the, the takeaway message is this and it's been proven through lots and lots and lots of lives but 
it does not matter where you're at today. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how many times you've fallen down or what you believe or any of that stuff. You can climb back up out of it. It doesn't matter what age, your education, your experience, your race, any of that stuff. If you believe in yourself, it is your God-given right. I'll even go further. It is your God-given duty to pull yourself up out of that hole and do the best that you can and put it on display. That's what I want people to be. I, I want them to hear because this protection and this vulnerability and this comfort that we all seek because we're superhuman, right? Yeah. Um, that is just a bunch of crap to get in the way of how you're supposed to be living. And here's the last thing I'll say. It's not for you. It's for everybody watching you. So I would love to see people get inspired and do more and make it consistent, just like you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. And I believe in you. And I think, you know, a lot of us, we don't have that, don't have enough belief for ourselves right now. So I think as someone, as a coach, as a person, as a human being, I believe in another human being. I believe the power that we all have. So I believe in you, Kyle. I believe in you too. I really do. And I, I feel better that somebody believes in me. So we'll see what we do with this, right? Yes. Give me a year. Give me a year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have you back on the show a year from today. And I'm going to play right. side by side. Um, that was a year ago. <laughs> Where are we now? <laughs> Let, let's sync our calendars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. And so that before, before I let you go, tell us where we, the people can find your book. Oh my God. Yeah. The book. I forgot <laughs> about that. Right. Uh, it's real simple. Go to patchworkjunkie.com. Um, and you had a small spelling error. I want to throw it out because I do believe in you. I um, saw that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You had patchwork Juni, uh, and I'm more of a July, but um, no, it's patchworkjunkie.com and it'll take you to my website little button on there and you can buy the book uh, for pre-order for pre-order right now. But please, please, please. Uh, we need all the pre-orders we can. Uh, my publisher wants me to be a best-selling author and I don't want to stop her. So <laughs> <laughs> I believe in her and, you know, I believe in you as well. So that's not just stop here. <laughs> okay. Hey, and one other thing, uh, at Kyle Dean Houston, everything is at Kyle Dean Houston. So Facebook, Instagram, um, you can find me at, at Kyle Dean Houston. You can also go to KyleDeanHouston.com um, for a bunch more um, really cool pictures of me. No, there's some stuff on there that's important. So they can go to, go to my website and get in contact with me. I'd love to talk to anybody that, um, uh, that, that, that needs to hear. Mm -hmm. Kyle has a great personality. You guys definitely want to go check out, <laughs> check out his website. And I will also link the PatchworkJunkie.com. Um, onto the episode note so that you have easy access to pre-order the book. It's called Patchwork Junkie. I had a typo and I just noticed it this morning when I woke up. <laughs> I, we did too. We did too. So spell it right and then we'll see if we can't save some lives. Uh, that's least, right. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you so much for coming, Kyle. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And like I said, you have a great personality and a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> The pleasure has been all mine. And I mean that. I say that to everybody else, but I mean it to you. Okay. So <laughs> thank you. I appreciate okay. that. Have a great day. All right, week. everybody. So thank you so much for joining me. And please stay tuned and stay in and check my coffee talk next week on Wednesday at eight o'clock Pacific time. I will see everybody then. Bye. I'll be there. Bye. <laughs>